Uh, good day. My name is Munir Raja, and I am the CEO and founder of Aroop Project Management. In this video, it will be a little bit long, so it's a webinar uh, links video uh, that is educational content. And in this video, I'm going to focus on the concept of project management levels, which we address in, in the past through other videos. Uh, however, in, in today's video, we will be elaborating on uh, how do those levels that we identify uh, identify as five levels, how do they appear in practice? So we will give some ideas uh, about each level of project management. So basically the idea here in this presentation is how to lead project uh, per the different level of project management that exists in today's practice. With this in mind, let's get going. I will cover uh, the topics that we cover today. First, I'm going to touch very quickly on respecting the diversity and introduce the levels. Uh, and then uh, after we introduce the levels and we talk about the five levels that we have identified, uh, we talk about level one, level two, level three, four, and five. And finally, we close this video with some question about how do these levels and uh, relate to the tr concept of traditional project management, adaptive project management, agile, waterfall, hybrid, etc. So let's go to topic one, respecting the diversity. It's well known in project management, and sometimes most people know that, and sometimes we find out that maybe many people do not fully understand the concept. There are a lot of commonality of project management. The processes, for example, every project need to have scope, every project need to have cost, every project need to have schedule, every project have resources. However, how do we apply project management? Uh, often need to follow certain methodology that may not be common across industries, type and domain. So here we need to highlight the concept that across domain, we do share processes in common concept However, they also have many differences. For example, project management in oil and gas is different than pharmaceutical, is different than marketing, is different than technology project. So the challenge for us is that how to manage them, how to manage these projects depend on uh, many factors. For example, the project context, uh, sector, domain, size, complexity, organizational impact of the project, degree of innovation, and many other variables. So that is one important aspect to understand. We also must distinguish between project led by service provider versus project owner. Obviously, if you are a service provider, you're doing work for a client. It's different than if you were the client that is will benefit from the outcome of the project. Further, even within the project owner, we might have different perspectives of the various stakeholders. For example, the business team, the financial team, the project team, uh, the technical team. Each one of them might have a different perspective as long as we can keep everything related to the overall of the project. So there is a quite a bit of diversity and the question becomes, how do we handle this diversity? Um, Domain expertise can be of significant value. For example, if I'm working in the petrochemical industry and I have no idea, I've never worked in the petrochemical industry. I come from marketing or, or psychology or IT. Uh, I might find it difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. And maybe in due time, I can learn the language. I can learn enough about the practice or the area of the practice, the domain, in order to become effective. However, uh, if I don't have that domain expertise, uh, I, might, I might have difficulties in managing project. Now here what we must say that project manager and team do not need to be technical expert in a given domain, but understanding the environment and context is vital. I'll give you an example. I started my career after I did a couple of years of engineering in the petrochemical industry. I've never worked with chemical engineering. I've, I've never been a mechanical engineer. I don't know enough about chemical engineering and mechanical engineering more than the courses you take in college. Uh, I am a civil engineer. So how do I work in a petrochemical industry? 
I was fortunate in that time that the company would give us courses, for example, to understand mechanical engineering for non-mechanical engineer, uh, process engineering for non-process engineer, and so on. Now, of course, those courses would not make, a, make us expert. I would not know how to design a, 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 a flow diagram. I don't know how to design a control valve station. I don't know how to design a pump, but at least I know what these things are. So again, what we are saying here is we don't have to become expert in that domain. That's not the intention because we are not designing for that domain. Uh, however, we need to have an understanding of the various components that are related to that domain. So if we have that expertise, uh, we can have significant value in leading our project. That one way to handle the diversity uh, is domain expertise. The second part of it is tailoring. If I'm even within the petrochemical industry, let's say, if I'm working on a small project that is, we call it plant modification or revamp or brownfield project, that might be a million dollar or two million dollars. That's one way. Or if I'm working on a mega project that could be more than a billion dollars, that I need to have another approach. So here, what we need, we need to tailor. We need to tailor and develop tailored method that are best fit for the organizational context and the project context. Therefore, what we mean by tailored method is to develop method, project management method, that fit the sector so that are customized to a sector domain or a vertical, depend what language you prefer or industry. Uh, it adapted to the project type. So even within the petrochemical industry, I will stay with that industry, managing a technology project in that industry versus managing a facility addition project or a new facility project, right? So we have to adapt to that type. Uh, what, what type of project I'm managing? And then we adjust for the project size and complexity, as I mentioned. If I'm managing a small project that could be a million dollars versus managing or working on a project that is a billion dollar, right? Uh, we need to adjust for that. Finally, we need to consider the development approach of the product itself. When we are building the product, what do we do? For example, in oil and gas petrochemical, if we are dealing with mega project, we might have modularization versus stick build. So those two terms we use. What does it mean? Does that mean we build the plant on, you know, piece by piece on, on a site, or we build module offshore somewhere or off, off site somewhere, and then we bring them to the site and install them like Lego pieces. So we have a different approach there, right? The type of contract could be different. In technology, um, you know, we might have the choice of having what we call Big Bang, uh, you know, where you deliver the product at the end, which usually in technology we don't like that, uh, or we use agile, iterative, incremental development. So here we need to consider that as well. And with these factors, once we consider all of them, uh, then we would have a tailored method that is typically good for many type of, for the project that fit that type and size and complexity and context. We also need to understand the various level and that comes next. Now, based on our research and studies and observation of the project management community, what we notice really, you know, a lot of people call, are called project managers. Right? And nothing wrong with, I'm not going to focus here on whether the title is applicable or not. However, in reality, not all project managers are created equal. And again, here I don't mean any statusing or anything of that nature. It's the type of work. I'm focusing on, on how do we manage project as a project manager. So if I'm working on small project, uh, maybe as a service provider or maybe as an IT department in a company, Often enough, our project management might be limited to task management, especially if we don't have systems in place. If we don't have processes and project management system in place, it's likely that we are managing tasks, right? So we, we have the scope of a project, we break it down into work packages or tasks, and we start to implement them one by one until we are done. Now, typically, again, I repeat, this might be suitable in small project, uh, or very, very small project, and where there are few team members, uh, or maybe a single team member, and 
uh, there are typically no processes in place. That's one level. And again, that might be good enough for the condition that we have. Another level, level two, is what we call stage management. In this case, we are responsible for managing a stage. It could be the engineering stage uh, for capital project. It could be a construction stage. Or it could be the implementation stage, for example, software, product management, right? The implementation of the product, building the product. Right? That is a stage. That is what we call an implementation stage of a bigger project. So in that case, we have stage management. And I'll explain a little bit on every one of these levels in the upcoming slide. Then we have what I like to call technical project management. Typically, this is a quite common practice, especially for those who follow standards like uh, and guide like PMI and ISO, where we talk about the project starting with a, a charter and ending with a product delivered, so an output. So that usually look at project management from this perspective that I am going from beginning to end, but the beginning is a charter and the end is the, the output. Then we go into a product delivery, which is quite similar, except in this case, the way we, we advocate here is that the beginning, the end will stay delivering the output, but the beginning, instead of starting with a charter, maybe get project management involved in the discovery phase of a project where we might be defining the business case, conducting feasibility study, or those kind of things. So we are, in a way, what we are doing, we, we started with the stage management, then technical project management, then product delivery management. So as you notice, the life cycle, the beginning and end is, is expanding. And then we have the value delivery model, and that is the model that we use in the Aroop platform, but technically everything here can be used, we can use the Aroop platform for that, but value delivery is focusing on delivering value. What Now, how is that different than product? You know, when I'm delivering the product, I'm done. I don't know if the product is good or validate the objective of the project. Value delivery focusing on defining the value, the benefit, the anticipated benefit that we expect from delivering that product or service or whatever the case might be, and then go into operation, go into initial operation at least, and verify or validate that what we built is delivering the expected benefit outcome and uh, leading to success. So with that in mind, let's go into each one of these levels. Level one, as we mentioned, task management, and you know we might like to call it informal project management. This is the most basic level where the focus is on managing tasks this level is typically appropriate for small project. I'm repeating things I said earlier to for emphasis. Accordingly, it's mostly informal, right? It's common practice within service provider organization and implementation unit within a project owner organization. It could use agile development or sequential development, big bang. And many PPM tools, project portfolio management tools support work at this level. When we hear people talking about Trello, for example, yeah? Uh, or uh, I'm not going to name the others, uh, but basically these are task management. You know, they are tools that are good for uh, uh, identifying, managing, and tracking tasks to completion. Now, in practice, level one in practice, what does it mean? Uh, we often use this quite simple and could include, so basically what we're saying, like, think, when I talk about level uh, in practice, these slide on in practice, just put yourself in the shoes of the project manager. So if you are a project manager, how would you apply level one in real life? Uh, first, you probably need to identify the requirement working with your stakeholder, working with your sponsor, with the end user, whoever defined, um, uh, defined the objective for the project. You identify the requirement leading to defining the scope. So you end up with the scope, uh, scope of work, work packages uh, or activities. Let's keep it at work package level. And then from the scope, from the work package, the team, you can identify, you can break those work packages. You can make them tasks or you can break them down further into tasks. Or in scheduling, we use the term activities. Uh, and then once you have that breakdown, you assign them to team member and you monitor the work. So it's quite simple and straightforward because remember these are small projects. The scope is very defined and limited 
and you only have few people working on such a project. Uh, so we, then we might do schedule and cost. Uh, however, most likely uh, the schedule and cost would be informal. So maybe more like a list for the schedule, maybe a list of activities uh, and maybe a rough timeline. Um, and costs could be informal, uh, especially if it's internal project where costs you don't have to go through a formal funding process or thing of that nature. And in a way, it's closer to guesswork rather than proper estimating technique. A quality risk and change management are likely to be absent or done on ad hoc basis. Basically, uh, you know, uh, you work, you probably don't identify risk or maybe you just do a very basic risk assessment Maybe you don't control change management, and as a result of that, scope creep could be happening. Uh, anyway, they are, uh, you know, if they exist, they, they're probably not very effective. And a final statement here, because it's quite informal, uh, control might be absent. We probably don't have a good project control, uh, monitoring and control in process. We just basically have tasks, tasks could be delayed, Okay, fine, they are delayed. Uh, and we keep going with the flow until we are done. Uh, obviously, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's a bad practice, uh, but it's not quite formal. And if your project is not critical or you know, some, some ambiguity and some flexibility and some looseness is okay with that, that's fine. Uh, that might be perfectly acceptable. If it's not perfectly acceptable, then maybe you need to consider level two. Level two is stage management. So usually typical and small, uh, I mean, uh, obviously uh, even mega project have stages, you can manage the stage. However, often this level probably exists on small, simple project. Uh, and typically would follow a process group like PMI or ISO. The typical stage management you see here, this is what Rook PM modified from, from ISO and PMI. Uh, so basically, instead of initiate, we have authorize. Uh, we split planning into plan management and plan the detail. Uh, we have control, we have implement, and we have close. So in this case, you are managing a stage, but usually, again, in small, simple project, unless you have good systems in place to allow it to manage a large project. So there is no single approach uh, since this could be informal, almost like level one uh, or semi-formal following PMO uh, or other guidelines that might exist in the company or organization where your work is. So if your organization doesn't have a process, then it's quite informal. And if your organization have a PMO or have guideline available, then it is becoming maybe semi-formal. And of course, in some situation, in in very mature project management system, uh, it could be quite formal, even managing a stage, especially if you are managing stages that could be, you know, like an engineering stage on a capital project, it could be a year long, right? So these could be substantial size stages. In those situations, there need to be quite a bit of a formal process. Uh, as we mentioned, we follow processes like PMI, uh, initiate, plan, implement implement, control, and close. Uh, and planning in this case might be limited, limited to scope, time, and cost, and defining the team as in a way a little bit more than we have at level one. At higher level would include, you know, if the organization is somewhat, somewhat semi-formal, have some guideline, have a PMO, then it is possibly they will go beyond the planning and they might have uh, some processes to include quality, risk change, communication, and control could be loose or strict, depend on the organizational level of maturity. Speaking of maturity, this has nothing to do with the level of maturity of organization, right? This is a typically the type of project management that we apply on different contexts, right? Maturity is more of an assessment of how the organization does. Uh, so I think that's clear, and I don't have to say that, but just for emphasis. Technical project management now, we are dealing with more than one stage. It could be two, three, four, five stages, whatever the case might be. However, uh, this is 
often uh, limited to the idea of uh, starting with a charter and end with an output, the product or the service of the project. Uh, so there could be many stages. Now, in practice, this level can be, again, in this case, now we notice we have informal, semi-formal, or formal. A lot of organization, again, and I think by now you should get uh, the gist of this, right? If the organization doesn't have processes in place, they might have some kind of very loose process of going from uh, charter or going from start to end uh, in, in an informal way, uh, or they could be somewhat formal, semi-formal, or quite formal. Okay? So here depends on, uh, th this is often relate, the informality or formality of the process is often linked to the maturity of the organization itself. Ideally, in practice, at level three, we should follow a tailored method, right? We're defining what the stages, you know, like we show here. What are the stages of that life cycle look like? When, where is the starting point? And where is the ending point? And as we mentioned, often enough, the starting is a charter or authorization, and the end point is delivering the product. Now, notice level four, you know, the, uh, the blue, uh, the dark blue chevron symbol look like the previous one like level three, but here we added the discovery, which means in this case, the organization is trying to elevate their project management to a situation where they get project management involved in the discovery phase. Now, if you look at, if you look at the Pumbag guide and other guide in ISO, uh, PMI and ISO don't say uh, there is no project work happening before. Actually, they say it differently. They say that is a pre-project work. So in their eyes, it, it, things might be changing, by the way. Uh, and, but in their eyes, at least up to the sixth edition of the Pumbag Guide, their project start with the charter. So anything before the charter, they call it pre-project. And the reason for that, because they consider that is not the responsibility of project management. And project management may not be involved in that. However, in recent years, we are seeing some interest that, well, yeah, project management may not be managing the discovery stage, but at least they need to be involved. You know, that discovery stage, although it is led by a sponsor, we might still need to get the project management input at that stage. However, it's still not very formally addressed of what the role of the project manager should be. And uh, especially in recent discussion, when we talk about project success, when we say the pro some people advocating that the project manager must be responsible for business success. Well, if the project manager is not involved in the discovery stage, is it even possible for them to be responsible for the project success in terms of business objective? If they're not setting the business objective and they're not managing the business objective, right? Uh, and they're not defining the market and all of that stuff, it becomes a separate issue. Anyway, let's leave the concept of project success for other videos. Here, what we are saying is that project management is involved, participating, supporting, whatever the case might be, in the early, uh, in the pre-project phase of a project, which we, we like to call discovery. Uh, in this case, the project start with the product vision, right? Because we are starting working on a product vision. And, but it still end up with a product, the output, right? Now, in practice, uh, this level is almost identical to level three, uh, except the primary difference is that project management is present. I'm repeating what I said on the previous slide. Accordingly, project management has input on the business case and feasibility study, but do not control the work. Still, in this level four, the focus is on the output of the project. Now, level five is quite is a little bit more different. We continue to expand the life cycle. In this case, this is a uh, Rook has a value delivery methodology that we are using to build the project management element of our Rook platform, the, the digital solution we are building. Uh, and the value delivery methodology as a concept emphasize the need for project management 
uh, during the discovery phase, like level four, but in this case, we'd like it to be more emphasis on the role of project management, more involvement, and even treating that stage, that phase, discovery phase or its stages as stages of a project like any other stage. So in that case, the stages and the phase will be managed by the project manager, although the sponsor will still have the decision on, uh, and the business side will still have decision on the objective of the project. However, now it is integrated effort. We are basically saying here, we need to integrate project management with the business side, with operation, with governance, in order to ensure or improve the chance of achieving our goals and success of the project. Now, one more thing we add here. I've often seen a lot of projects, including mega projects, where let's say facilities project. We built the facility, but we cannot start to operate it yet. Why? Because we were late in our operational readiness. Now, what does operation readiness? In a facility project, it could include hiring the staff, the IT system, the marketing, the sales effort that are required. So when that facility is turned over, is handed over, and we can start to operate it. Often enough, if this is delayed, we'll end up with a facility that is completed, but we cannot operate it. In one case, I know when I was working in Dubai, a building across from my office was Finish and for four years it was locked. Nobody could go in there because they couldn't get power access to the building. Right? I mean that was an extreme case. But I've seen a lot of other project, a museum project, a nuclear plant project where we finish, but we were not finished with the operational readiness from testing perspective, procedure, maintenance procedure, operating procedure. In technology, operational readiness could include the going to market strategy setting up the marketing and sales channels and those kind of things. So in this value delivery methodology that we advocate, level five, is that project management is heavily involved in the discovery phase and they are also managing the operational readiness and initial operation stages. Now, what we're saying managing, we're doing obviously the management, we're not necessarily doing, remember, domain expertise. We're not the technical expert that doing the technical work but it needs to be managed in a coordinated way. Unfortunately, some people do not understand this concept and they think, oh, this is a program management now. No, it's not. It's not program management because unless all of these are completed, the project will not deliver to the objective. I cannot operate the facility. I cannot operate the software. I cannot go to market, right? So this is why in, it is really essential part of the project. However, it's often done by a separate team. I give you another example. It's a very common example we see in, uh, in the Middle East and West Asia and actually around the world, hotels, hotels. Often enough, you might find a company that investor and they, are, they, uh, they wanna build a suite uh, or series of hotels in a given geographical area. However, that the company is really more of an investment company and doesn't have operation of hotel experience. So they would hire some of the big name or local name, you know, like uh, Marriott or Hilton or others to become the operator of those hotels. So in that case, usually the owner would have a team working on the design, engineering and construction of the hotel, while you have the operator, uh, let's say Hilton, for example, might be doing all the operation readiness uh, to get ready for operation. Now, what we're saying here, that's nothing wrong with that, except as, as long as we are integrating the two together, right? Uh, so with this methodology, uh, it requires a comprehensive focus on the project from ideation to operation. Very important to, to, to emphasize that point. So it goes beyond delivering an output. Uh, it is built on the concept of integrating project management with the business governance operation I'll show you a slide on that. Accordingly, the focus on the outcome, the realization of benefit, the shareholder value, right? And that is the main difference from technical project management, where my job is just to de deliver the output and I don't care what happened. I mean, obviously I care, but it's not my responsibility or role to be involved 
and deciding what output is or what would happen with that output once it's delivered. Now, a typical life cycle um, view of this graphically, uh, you can notice the pinkish area is a typical project life cycle per level three, right? Uh, which means starting with a charter uh, and ending with, an, uh, obviously closure, everything ends with closure, but usually with the product delivered at the end of an implementation stage. Uh, and then we add to it the area in green, the discovery phase work uh, early on and the operational resilience work that come in parallel. And you notice it is shown in parallel later. So that is a visual of a level five in practice. This is another visual uh, and we're hiding a lot of detail here because otherwise it become very complex. We have a probably a 40 minute video on, on, on a slide like this only. Uh, you can you can find it on our YouTube channel. However, the main things here is on top we are showing a life cycle and that life cycle could be different depend on what type of project you are. But on the left, we are showing the, the, uh, this, uh, the swim lane, the road, if you wish, depend what you like to use, uh, which we have the business side, the product development side or product management side, the project management side, the governance and operation. And the idea is that of the slide is that across the life cycle from ideation from the very beginning until the end and the end in this case is in the bluish the project completion uh, is that go from ideation to operation and then or initial operation to be fact and then once everything is final and we do final acceptance testing and the facility or the software or whatever the case it's operating well we might go into an operation period for the future, uh, for a future project and future enhancement project. That in a way describe the different type of levels and how they operate or act in practice. Uh, now it, I, I'm left with probably two slides. This one focusing on the question of agile because we, we hear a lot of debate about traditional project management adaptive project management, agile project management, waterfall, hybrid, a lot of these terminology. So we start with the idea that uh, we want everybody to remember that project management has always been adaptive. So whenever we say project management, by default, by default, we are talking about being adaptive, right? What does it mean? We use that mean is that we use the right approach that is best fit for the context of the project. We continue all this debate about agile and waterfall and agile and agifall and all these terminologies that come up with confuse the concept that at the end of the day, all of it is trying to sell certification and trying to sell product and trying to sell consultancy and coaching. At the end of the day, that means we are losing focus of what project management is all about. When I hear the word agile project management or waterfall project management, I'm sorry to say that I lose the respect often of the speaker. Because what is agile project management? And if you look at, and, and again, I have many videos on this topic, so I'm not gonna go through it, but I wanted to emphasize that point that project management must follow those level I discuss, especially if you are a project owner organization you're not, you, and you are not using level five or level four as a minimum, you are missing a lot. There is a very high chance that you will not have an optimal performance on your project, right? And it's very important to stress that regardless what type of project you work on, whether it's marketing or sales or engineering or, or technology or robot or university, right, you have to always adapt the methodology to fit your need. So that's very important. So traditional project management is adaptive project management is project management, right? So whether in my, in my book, and if you follow me and you follow some of my work, you know, what I call traditional project management or adaptive project management is the same thing as project management. Unfortunately, some people 
when they use the word traditional project management, they link it to waterfall, which is absolutely not true. I mean, they it's true they they link it, but that's that is inaccurate. Let's put it that way. <laughs> To, to be nice uh, instead of saying nastier words. So in our view, project management is adaptive. Project management, traditional project management is adaptive. And therefore, project management is a good term. So to have a lot of this discussion today about agile or waterfall or hybrid or digital project management, we've been hearing that a lot recently about digital project management. A lot of it is just nothing, it, in my view, is doing nothing except confuse everybody. Then we have hybrid project management. If it is a thing, it's adaptive. So basically, we, all what we did uh, was hybrid. If, if we mean by hybrid the flexibility of doing this uh, or being adaptive, then again, we're back to project management. So why do we need to create all these terms and create all that confusion and trying to define what everybody define? The problem is everybody end up defining agile and waterfall and hybrid the way they like it to be to make a case to sell their coaching or sell certification. Again, I'm, I'm being very direct and blunt here, uh, but at the end of the day, if you really search about it, what is it? What is hybrid project management? It is project management. It is project management. It is adaptive, it's flexible, right? And that's where competent project manager and mature project management organization understand they have to use, there is a huge spectrum uh, on what do we do? And I, I have to say that before I close this topic, Waterfall and Agile are not about project management. And again, I might be making many enemies here. They are about product development. When we talk about Agile, I have been spending more than two years building the Uruk platform. And I use Agile, I use my value delivery methodology to, to manage the entire uh, work. And for the product building part, the software building part, we use agile development. We use incremental iterative development, right? So uh, I'm not anti-agile in this case, we, but it's, we need to stress that agile about development, but product development, building the product, not about managing the project, okay? Finally, uh, accordingly, uh, the project management level can work with product development mode, whether you are dealing with building the product regardless of what the product is, right? Uh, so it's very important to stress that. Finally, we've been working on the Uruk platform. I've mentioned that more than once in this uh, presentation. Where does the Uruk platform fit? At which level? Technically speaking, you can use Uruk platform for any of the levels. However, however, uh, Let's be clear. If you are at level one, uh, I would not advise you to use the, the Rook platform because you are doing task management, nothing more than task management. And for that, there are a lot of software out there that could even be free that can help you manage tasks. Sure, you might not be able to keep the history and documentation and everything else. However, for if you are working as an owner organization or as an organization working on multiple projects, at level five or level four or even level three, uh, I would advise you to use something like the Uruk platform because you have the entire workflow, the entire process built into the process, built into the digital solution, right? Even for level two. However, the ideal, the ideal usage of something like the Uruk platform is level three, four, or five, right? And Advantage of a digital solution. Obviously, there are many advantages of digital solution. We will have a separate video on the Uruk platform at some other time, uh, or you can search some of the videos we have recorded in the past, and you will be able uh, to tell more or learn more about it. At the end, I'll just say thank you. Uh, please uh, follow, you can follow our website or register on our website. Recently, we've been adding a lot of content and case studies in a section that is restricted for those who register on the site. So uh, if you, you can just go to the website anytime you want, but if you want access to that restricted content, you would need to register on our website. Uh, if you'd like to visit our platform website, it's here. And if you'd like to have a strategy session or a discussion, open free discussion, 
uh, with me. My Calendly link is here. And with this, I say thank you again. I wish you success today, tomorrow, and always.